So finally, we're hearing from Professor Audrey Bowen uh, from the University of Manchester's Jeffrey Jefferson Brain Research Centre. Audrey is a psychologist, a stroke researcher and an educator. And her research focuses on rehabilitation and living with disability. And like Terry, she was one of the first cohort of psychologists and physicians funded through the Stroke Association's lectureship scheme. Audrey's goal as a researcher is to improve the lives of stroke survivors with thinking, memory and communication difficulties, as well as the lives of their families and friends who provide informal care. Tonight, she'll be talking about how she involves stroke survivors and carers in designing and conducting research projects and the huge untapped potential of rehabilitation to transform the lives saved by stroke medicine and how we need to ramp up our efforts to make the most of rehabilitation research. So, without further ado, here's Professor Audrey Bowen. Thank you, good evening. It's wonderful to be with you all tonight. Um, I know that we share a common purpose. We all want to raise awareness of the psychological difficulties after stroke, and we want to make sure that we can direct the future research into the focus that research into the priorities that really matter uh, to people who live with stroke. Um, thanks so much, Mark. You need a big thank you and your team on Emmerdale because of raising awareness in this way. It is fantastic to reach that kind of television audience. It's really needed, so thank you. And thank all of you as well, the donors here tonight, um, for all your generosity. And I hope that you will feel that you can continue to uh, continue to support stroke research and researchers. Stroke research has been very successful, fantastically successful, and you've heard a lot about that already. So thanks to research, people survive, and that's what we really need. That's our starting point. They survive their stroke and they live long lives. And nowadays, as you've heard, people, we can make sure that people can very quickly get into hospital, very quickly get into specialist units in hospital, have access to these specialist drugs and surgical treatments, and have access to uh, specialist rehabilitation in the hospital and in that early phase after the hospital. And that's all great. And we don't want to undermine it. But the reality, and I'm the downer here, am not I? It's just the beginning. It's the beginning phase of a long and often challenging journey um, through life after stroke. Because people may spend hours, days, weeks in hospital and early services, but many people will spend months, years, decades living in the community with uncertainty about the effects of stroke. So we really need to direct our efforts equally there. Surviving a stroke is obviously essential, but is it sufficient? It's time for research to focus on adding quality to the lives that have been saved so that people can actually thrive. I would rather be in this cornflower type meadow thing here than this tragic little plant trying to grow through the cracks, quite frankly. Rehabilitation research is central to this aspiration that we enable people to thrive. But if we're honest, we really have to gear up substantially to meet the size of the challenge. Now, we have very clear direction about how, where to go with research. For example, on the left, this is the current being updated, but the current national clinical guideline for, for some parts of our four nations. Um, it tells us that the research evidence that underpins some of the clinical recommendations, particularly those around how to support people with their thinking and memory, um, that that evidence is unfortunately not strong enough. It's, it is weak, if we're honest, and actually it's often it's absent. It just doesn't exist. It hasn't been done. We have some good evidence, but we have big gaps in evidence. And clinicians and their managers need much stronger evidence from us, from rehabilitation researchers, because they've got to get those successful business cases in so that they can actually get more publicly funded therapy for people, more therapy and for longer. So these gaps in the evidence map marry up very nicely with what Adi was saying there, with the priorities that stroke survivors and carers tell us are theirs for research. These three Cs um, are in the top 10 research priorities. So cognition, communication, 
and carers. Um, and as I said, cognition is number two. And I'm going to give you some brief examples of research in these. But I guess what I really thought that I would do in this talk was to, um, was to stress the essential enablers for research success. So what we really have to do is build capacity. We have to massively increase the rehabilitation research workforce. Stroke Association is doing a lot there, NIHR is doing a lot there, and some of the other funders. But there's so much more we could do. We could have a stroke academy. NIHR has an NIHR academy. We, um, in the second one, in collaboration, we have to work together rather than <coughs> compete. Uh, if we're going to deliver the kind of research evidence at the scale and pace that we need to do, we have got to work together, and we're going to have to work across the four nations, of course. And we're mindful that some of the funding sources are a little bit restricted to which uh, countries can apply for them. Uh, consensus, as Terry said perfectly, we have to stop doing things and measuring things in too many ways. So let's not have all our pet topics and tests. We actually have to, it's going to be difficult, but we have to reach consensus. Research is not a solo activity, though. It's definitely a team effort. At the centre of that team is the person with stroke and the uh, family, the carers. But it also needs to have people from the universities, um, the staff and the postgraduate students working with the NHS staff. It needs to have the buy-in from the uh, public funders, such as the National Institute for Health Research, and the private donors. And Stroke Association has been very successful at enabling and um, bringing together uh, uh, these funding groups and helping us all in building networks. I was very fortunate. I was in the first cohort of lecturers to be funded um, through donations to Stroke Association. And so for five years, my employer got, uh, was reimbursed for some of my time and so I could work on stroke research. And in that time, um, I was promoted to professor and part of the leadership role was really about spotting and developing talent, which is one of the nicest parts of your job, really. So the capacity building, nurturing the future uh, research, rehabilitation research leaders. And these are six, these six here um, are some of the uh, wonderful early career researchers. It's a very uh, multidisciplinary team, as it should be for stroke rehabilitation. So psychologists, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists. A key point is that each of these, in turn, went on to secure further funding. Um, either projects, fellowships, uh, patient involvement activities, and in some cases, even the holy grail of university-funded permanent lectureships, <laughs> believe it or not. This positive ripple effect goes wider, though, um, and I'm not unusual. This is the case for many people who are uh, funded as, through the lectureship programme. Um, so, these are some of the postgraduate students, some of the interns, some of the volunteers we work with in Manchester, but also um, in different parts of the country, in, in Australia and the US and Canada, um, and our visitors from Italy. So what I really want to, the point I want to make is that an investment in one stroke association lecturer provides a very good return towards building capacity in the future workforce. Was that me? Um, <laughs> PCPI stands for Patient, Carer and Public Involvement, and it's essential for good research. And what involvement means is working in partnership with the stroke survivors and carers across a range of activities. And, um, and Addy's told you about some of that, which is getting involved in the actual research priorities. Now, I've been lucky across my career because I've worked with a, a great number of wonderful stroke survivors and carers. Some of them are shown here, and I want to make sure I acknowledge their contributions. So for each project, I certainly recommend a study-specific um, patient or carer advisory group because you get ownership through the whole project um, and involvement across that study lifespan. People get involved in designing it, recruiting to it, collecting data, and importantly, thinking about how do we communicate the findings so that they'll actually have impact in everyday life. Involvement certainly does take time, needs resources, needs money. But it's worth it, and it's worth it because we need it to do research in the right way and to do the right research. So the couple of examples then. Um, 
You may have noticed there was one face that, if I get the right button here, here we go, Anne. There we go, Anne's in the front row here, Anne from Manchester. So Anne appeared on lots of the slides. And Anne works with us in Manchester and we're very lucky. After her stroke, I think Anne's first contact was actually being a participant in the study. But since then, Anne has been an active member of several of the involvement groups, progressing to leading a group as she did in a study, a recent cognitive study that we did called Spatial. And Anne's next challenge is that she's accepted an honorary post, and we're delighted, as the lay lead for research involvement in Manchester at the Geoffrey Jefferson Brain um, Research Centre. So that will include people with stroke, um, but Anne will be uh, campaigning to work with people who have experience of different conditions, such as brain tumours, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. So thank you, Anne, for everything that you do. Now, cognitive difficulties of thinking and memory, um, there are many types. One is called spatial neglect, and here for the third time tonight is a clock. <laughs> they are just so ubiquitous, aren't they? Um, so one of these difficulties is that uh, it's called spatial neglect, it's called inattention, it's got a lot of names. That's the problem. It's describing difficulties that people have with their attention, directing attention and awareness to space around them. Some of that space is the space of their body, some of it's actually their area around them. Most people have difficulty with the left space, but what it means in real life is that people might not actually be able to put their arm in their sleeve. They may not be able to uh, be finding the fork on the left side of the plate. Uh, when people go out, when they're trying to walk around the house, they may bump into things on the left and going out uh, shopping. Um, there is a, the problem is there's a huge amount of research into neglect, which is a funny thing for a researcher to be saying, especially someone who has done research in, in neglect, but there's an awful lot. And yet, despite this, we seem to have more uncertainties than certainties. Um, so what we really do need is some clarity. How many people have neglect? What is the best way to actually detect it? And what are the most effective treatments? And when we did the Cochrane Review, we saw every single therapy trial for neglect. There were 65 of them, and they looked at eight different therapies. So you think, hooray, we're going to get an answer at last. But actually, the quantity of studies is not equivalent to the quality. And sadly, the quality of the evidence so far is just not good enough, ambitious enough, consistent enough to guide practice. So what we really need is consensus. Um, we have to stop doing things, measuring things in lots of different ways, and we need to agree the best way. So we've been involved in a small collaboration um, that we call ISAND around this spatial attention and neglect disorders. And what we're doing at the moment um, with people from different parts of the world here is that we're completing this consensus exercise on the, that we've gone back to the beginning. Um, where what we did was we invited experts in neglect and we're very pleased that 66 of them took part from 15 different countries and they stuck with us they've gone through three rounds of these big online delphi surveys where they all start off with no cons no consensus all their ideas and they're moving them through round and round saying what is can we agree what to call it what it is how should we um, detect it um so we're just about to finish that, and I'm very hopeful that we're actually going to reach quite a bit of the consensus, but it feels frustrating to be having to go back to the beginning when you really want to be getting on with the therapy. The, I said I'd also mention, uh, very briefly, the other areas of communication and carers. So Claire Mitchell, who's shown on the left here, is a speech and language therapist, and Claire has been recently funded by the Stroke Association. And Claire and her um, involvement uh, team up here have been working with people in the UK and Australia. And this is about research to reach consensus about dysarthria, a speech difficulty after stroke. Um, it's very co it's common, um, it impacts the lives of people, and yet it actually has, has attracted very little research interest. And Claire's team are about to change that because they're working on another aspect of consensus, which is trying to reach consensus on the core outcome measures. What should you measure if you're wanting to measure? Has this had a good outcome? Has this treatment worked? What areas should you measure and what measurement tools should you actually have in there and to get agreement on that? And my final area is carers. Um, stroke also affects, as we have heard, the families and the friends. Uh, many of them take on this role as the informal caregiver. 
but they often need to be supported in that role so it doesn't cost them their own health and their own well-being and financial security. There is not enough research into carers. There are some pockets of research. We have the capacity to, to work together, but what we really need is uh, capacity building, collaboration and consensus. Involvement from the carer groups is essential and we in, uh, in uh, Manchester when we ran the trial uh, called Oscars which is organising support for carers of stroke survivors we worked with that great group and um, we're hoping that they're going to work with Beth now um, Beth is the trainee clinical psychologist at the moment who's going to be actually looking at how carers identify as carers and their preferences around the language because maybe labeling someone a carer or a caregiver is itself a barrier to people feeling that they um, that this is relevant to them and they should access support so unusually I think for a, a researcher I'm not going to end by saying we need more research I'm going to leave you with the words of the late great Doug Altman the statistician who said we need less research we need better research and we need research that's done for the right reasons so thank you all for your support and I hope you'll continue to do so thank you so much uh, thank you Audrey yeah, um, again, just once again, just to let you know that that's the, the feedback we've been getting on the show is that the carers' uh, lives change overnight, their roles change overnight, and there's the, the, everybody who's responded on social media feels like they need more of a voice. So, yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what we've been hearing too.